Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Engineered Viruses as Precision Cancer Therapeutics, presented by Alexander T. Baker, a PhD candidate in the Parker Lab at Cardiff University. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge that window, just click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of that slide window. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the Answer a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Mr. Alexander T. Baker. Alex's research is in the nascent field of oncolytic virotherapy, utilizing re-engineered adenoviruses to specifically target and destroy cancer cells. He gained his first degree at Aberdeen University completing a project on the soluble isoform of the immune checkpoint inhibitor CTLA-4 in the lab of Dr. Frank Ward. In 2015, Alex moved to lab of Dr. Alan Parker at Cardiff University, where he combined his experience of protein engineering and cancer immunology in the development of new virotherapies. As well as his Cardiff-based research, Alex maintains an active collaboration with Dr. Matish Barad at the Mayo Clinic developing next-generation antibody therapies for genetically defined cancers. For a more complete bio on our presenter, please click on Alex's biography tab. Alex, you may now begin your presentation. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction there, Christina. Um, yes, thank you very much to Gibco for inviting me to talk as part of this seminar series and for LabRoots um, for hosting today. Um, before I kick off, I just want to thank all the people involved in the research that I'm going to be talking about today um, and also to all of our funders, uh, Wellcome Trust, Cancer Research UK, um, LSRNW, and ten of us as well, and of course Cardiff University. Um, so with that, I will just get to the talk. Um, I'm here to talk to you today and give a broad overview of oncolytic virotherapy. And to do this, I'm going to be talking both about the engineering research that we're doing in our lab to create specifically targeted viral vectors to go after cancer, and also I'm going to be using examples from elsewhere in the field as well. And this really is just a broad overview, so uh, if anybody has specific questions, please do get in touch with uh, myself or the lab generally. So I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention everyone who's been involved in this, because it obviously isn't just me. Uh, on the left, we've got a picture of the lab group that's based here in Cardiff um, in the Henry Welcome building. And then on the right, uh, there's people from all over the place. Um, big thanks to Linda Coughlin over at uh, Mount Sinai in New York. Uh, the guys at the top left there um, have all been instrumental in a bunch of crystallography work that I've been doing. And of course, thank you to uh, Alan Gavin and John, who make up my supervisory team across my PhD, and a big thanks to Sarah and James as well, who are postdocs here. So a question that I usually get when I start talking about oncolytic virotherapy is, what is it? Um, it's actually a very old idea uh, based on classical biochemical exploitation of the differences between cancer cells and healthy cells. Um, it predates penicillin, in fact. Um, the idea being that cancer cells, as kind of highly replicative protein factories, if you will, are an ideal host for viruses which require protein replication in order to make copies of themselves. Um, since this very old idea, the field has morphed beyond all recognition, of course, 
and modern oncolytic barotherapy is more like gene therapy and uh, we're also beginning to exploit the immunological uh, mechanisms involved and uh, there was a recent review actually um, that was talking about how antiviral immunity is actually a key part of how um, oncolytics can actually work as a therapy. And the vectors that we use are no longer crude wild-type viruses um, or even simply passage viruses, as is the case for traditional vaccine methods. Um, they're much, much more heavily engineered, both rationally and irrationally, as I'll be talking about later today. So the next thing people say is that these people already have cancer and you really want to give them a virus. They make you ill, you know. Well, A, not all of them do. Most viruses, and in fact the best ones, you never even knew you had. And the reason for that is it's not in a virus's interest to harm its host, because if it harms its host, it no longer has anywhere to grow. So adenoviruses, which is what I'm going to be focusing on today, most people have been infected with. And most people, at worst, had a cold. A virus's main job is simply to make copies of itself. That's all it's for. It's not there to make you ill. And it does this by finding the correct type of cell to infect. It then enters that cell, makes copies of itself, and spreads out. So it's nature's own DNA delivery vehicle. So what do I need to do to make a virus a therapeutic? Well, first of all, we've got to be able to target our virus, and we can do that at the genetic level by using tumor-specific promoters, which are promoters which are particularly active in cancerous cells. We can go after cell surface level regulation, looking at cancer-specific markers on the cell surface, and we can also make our viruses replication incompetent, um, except in the presence of certain cancer mutations, for example, a mutated P53. And it's no good being able to just target our cancers if we can't also destroy the unhealthy cells. So we can do this by immune stimulation. We can rely on the virus's own lytic activity, so physically bursting the cancer cells like a balloon. And we can also do this by delivery of toxic transgenes, which is something I'll just touch on at the end today. And all of this can be achieved through the engineering methods that we have both in-house and among our collaborators. So what's the catch then? Why aren't we all treating cancers with virotherapy already? And obviously there are some issues with the field which are being addressed. So first of all, we have to address the problems with the native tropism of the virus. So adenovirus interacts with factors in the blood. It tends to get traffic towards the liver. And naturally, it's a respiratory infection as well. So it interacts with the lungs and esophagus. And we need to be able to avoid all of these things, lest our therapeutic virus get mopped up in these tissues before it can reach the tumor and have its therapeutic action. We also have a big issue surrounding host immunity. So like I mentioned before, most people have actually been infected with adenovirus before. And the body doesn't know that the virus that we're giving it is a therapeutic. It sees it as a foreign pathogen, so it tries to neutralize it. And if it does this too efficiently, it neutralizes it before it can reach its cancer cell, its target, then it can't actually have its therapeutic action. And finally, we have the problem that you have with pretty much any drug, which is issues with off-target. So off-target infections in this case could be particularly damaging because if we go after our cancerous tissue, even with a targeted virus, and we share a receptor with another tissue, then we could actually have targeted destruction of something which is not our cancer. So we have to be very careful with our targeting practices. So before I move into the nuts and bolts of the engineering, just want to give you a quick rundown of what adenovirus is and how it works. So our adenovirus, you can see here on the left, has three primary capsid proteins. It's got the fiber protein, which is divided into the N-terminal region, the shaft, and the knob domain, with that knob domain forming the primary interaction with the uh, cell. That N-terminus links to the penton protein at the base, and then that interacts with the hexon protein, which is the most abundant protein in the adenovirus and uh, forms also a bunch of different interactions and is a big part of the immune response. So this is the adenovirus infection pathway as it's understood for adenovirus serotype 5. Um, there are many, many different adenoviruses. Uh, there are 50 
two canonical ones right now, um, but I think we're actually up to more like 87 if you include the ones which aren't fully characterized. Um, so adenovirus type 5 is the most well studied. Um, the fiber knob domain comes along and attaches to the CAR receptor, so names its Coxsackie and adenovirus receptor. This shaft domain then flexes out of the way and allows interaction with alpha B integrins. This stimulates endocytosis of our virus, which then immediately gets traffic towards the lysosomal pathway and results in a pH shift, which activates a viral protease, cleaving off that fiber protein at the shaft. We then have adenoviral escape from the endosome and then trafficking along the microtubule network to the nucleus. So we have a bunch of different strategies we can actually employ to engineer these viruses. And broadly speaking, there are two approaches that we take in our lab. First of all, we have our bottom-up strategy, which is where we start with a well-characterized adenovirus, such as adenovirus type 5. We then work to improve its tumor selectivity. We then look to detarget it so that it doesn't go after its native tropisms anymore, retarget it to go after cancerous cells, and resulting in an improved AD5 based vector. Next up, we have our top down strategy, which is the inverse of this. So instead of starting with a well characterized vector, we start with an adenovirus which has not been well characterized at all. And then we pan through these viruses looking for beneficial phenotypes. So we can start off with something and then we can improve its selectivity again. We can then look at the viral interactome to find ways that we can go after cancer cells that are new. And we can also look uh, for new viral mechanisms. And eventually, we can create a chimeric vector which incorporates these for therapeutic effect. So we can actually achieve all of this through a mechanism that's known as recombineering, which is a technology which is developed in-house here at Cardiff by Gavin Wilkinson and Richard Stanton. So what we do to alter our viruses seamlessly is we start with a vectorized version of the viral genome in something called a BAC, a bacterial artificial chromosome, which to all intents and purposes here is a giant plasmid. We then look for the region of the viral genome which we want to alter, and we create homology arms flanking a DNA insert which we want to make. And then we rely on lambda phage genes which are engineered into our E. coli host strain for homologous recombination into the BAC to allow swapping over of that region that we want to alter. It's actually a two-step process, but if anyone has any further questions, please do ask me at the end. Um, and then we can go ahead and culture our virus um, in 293 cells. This system is enormously powerful as it allows us to seamlessly alter almost any region of the viral genome. So I'm going to start off by giving some examples of the bottom-up strategy where we work with the well-characterized AD5 virus. So I mentioned earlier that we have problems with um, native tropism. So one of those is integrins, as I mentioned in the AD5 pathway. And uh, this does assist with trafficking towards the spleen. So we can actually create a mutation within the penton protein um, in an RGD motif and make that into an RGE motif instead and prevent um, proper interaction with those integrins. And it's kind of difficult to uh, illustrate this one succinctly because this is, uh, the effectiveness of this mutation has been built up across the literature over a very long time. But on the right here, you can see that when we put the RGE mutation into the AD5 penton protein, we have strongly reduced splenic transduction. Another issue is AD5's native interactions with the blood. So it can interact with blood clotting factor 10. And if it does this, this forces the virus to traffic towards the liver, where it all gets mopped up there. And if we have all of our virus in the liver, then it's not getting to our therapeutic location. So on the right in the blue, you can see the uh, bases in the AD5 hexon protein, which are mutated in order to prevent this factor 10 interaction. And on the bottom, there is some biocore data. You can see in orange that AD5 comes along. It binds very strongly to factor 10, um, and it doesn't really come off. It's an extremely tight interaction. However, if you look at the purple line, that's the AD5 HVR7 mutation. 
and we've got almost no interaction at all. So we've successfully ablated both integrin and sector 10 binding. So if we look at uh, how these mutations work in combination, we can see here an uh, illustration of a virus which has both the penton and hexon RG and HVR7 mutations. And this is an image of some mouse organs who have been treated with the indicated viruses. So you can see that with regular AD5, um, there's a very strong blue color in the liver, and that's indicative of viral interaction, and there's not very much in the spleen. Uh, but if we add that factor 10 ablating HBR7 mutation, we can see that our liver returns to a yellow color, and there's no real viral interaction there because that factor 10 interaction is no longer trafficking our virus into the liver. However, what we've done is drive our virus to the spleen. But if we then combine our mutations, we can see that we've managed to completely avoid liver infiltration and also spleen as well. So those two mutations are working together to detarget our virus. So I've talked about the secondary interactions. What about that primary interaction with Coxsackie and the denovirus receptor? So if we make something called the K01 mutation, which is a two residue substitution SP to EA in the fiber knob domain, we can successfully block that interaction with CAR. So if you just pay attention to the black bars for now on the left of that graph, on the left we've got AD5 showing transduction of Cho CAR cells. Uh, Cho CAR cells have no adenovirus receptors except for um, Coxsackie adenovirus receptor. So as you would expect, the wild type virus capsid successfully interacts and you've got a tall black bar. On the right with the K01 mutation, it's almost completely ablated. You're really looking at background noise in the assay there. And uh, the others are controls, which I'll happily go into if asked. So we've managed now to ablate our virus's primary and secondary receptor tropism. So we've successfully crippled our virus now. So we need to start building it back up again and finding a therapeutic target. So what are we looking for in a therapeutic cancer target? We're looking at something which is highly expressed and highly specific. So this is distribution data, so number of positive tumors um, for a receptor called alpha V beta 6 integrin. And you can see that in an awful lot of cancers, this is very highly expressed, although it does vary by the cancer itself. Alpha V beta 6 integrin is an oncophyto antigen. So it's only expressed in um, neonatal development and it's also expressed in wound healing, which means that in regular healthy tissues in an adult, anyone who's going to have cancer, it's not really present at all. However, since it's on our cancers, it makes it a very, very good marker and a very selective marker as well. So this is a model of uh, alpha V beta 6 integrin, which was published a short while ago. Um, in the green, we have the alpha V component and in the purple, the beta 6. Uh, we also know that alpha beta 6, it's not on that table there, is highly upregulated in pancreatic cancer, um, which makes what I'm about to tell you very exciting because that has exceptionally poor prognosis right now. So what we can do is work with something called A20 peptide. And the A20 peptide is actually derived from foot and mouth disease virus, and it uses alpha V beta 6 integrin as its native target in cattle. So what we've done is we have disrupted the loop on the end of uh, the adenovirus, um, adenovirus loop, which is seen in the cyan here on the right, and we've inserted this A20 peptide, which is pictured in the dark blue. So we end up with three copies of our A20 peptide per fiber knob protein. By doing this, we've successfully retargeted our virus towards some cells which are otherwise completely um, resistant. So these are BT20 triple negative breast cancer cells. Uh, triple negative breast cancer has probably got the worst prognosis of, yeah, the worst prognosis of all the breast cancers for sure and uh, probably of a lot of the gynecological cancers. So by inserting this A20 loop into our fiber knob domain, we can actually retarget the AD5 here so that it's capable of infecting these BT20s when otherwise it's incapable. And we can further stimulate that infection by combining it with the K1 mutation. So we've now broken down our virus so it's incapable of interacting um, with its native cells. And then we've provided it with a new receptor and a new cell type which is of therapeutic benefit. 
So that native tropism is gone by the ablation mutations, and then our off-target infection is eliminated by going after a highly cancer-specific marker. But we are still left with the issues surrounding host immunity. So an example of how we can avoid host immunity is embodied in some of the top-down strategy. So this is where we work with a poorly characterized adenovirus instead of the well-characterized AD5. So the question is, if we're going to work with a poorly characterized adenovirus, which one? Because this is the phylogeny of all of the primate adenoviruses which exist at the moment. Um, there are more than just this, though. There have recently been described uh, aquatic snail adenovirus and uh, adenovirus for birds of prey and sea lions and all sorts of things. Um, yeah, there, there really is a huge diversity in this family, and the vast majority of them are extremely understudied. So the species Cs are probably the best studied of these, and uh, AD5 is a species C virus. They're very well tolerated, but they have very limited efficacy. The Es, um, there was actually some work done here in Cardiff a long time ago uh, by Gavin Wilkinson and his team uh, generating an anti-AD4 vaccine for the US military. Species Bs, they have low seroprevalence rates, and uh, there is some exciting work happening with species Bs, actually, uh, with the NAD2 serev ad one story out of Len Seymour's lab in Oxford. Uh, the species Ds are by far the most diverse of the adenovirus species, and um, you can probably tell by the amount of information that I'll be coming back to those. The species A's are a small species. They're quite understudied, potentially car utilizing, but there's not much information out there for them. The S are kind of bonkers. They've got two different fiber proteins. We really don't know what they're doing in terms of receptors, um, but they are quite common. And the species G's, there are quite a lot of uh, simian and rhesus serotypes which are newly described in here. So where do we look? We're going to look at an alternative species to species C, because as I mentioned, they have limited efficacy. We're kind of beginning to understand the Bs. Got a lot of information about the Cs. There's not much diversity in the other species, which leaves us with the Ds, which are extremely poorly characterized. And uh, despite a bit of confusion in the literature there, there is not really much information known about what receptor those subgroup Ds use. Uh, some of them have been shown to use sialic acid, but most of them, it's completely unknown. So those Ds are where we're going to look. And they actually, they contain 35 of the 52 canonical adenovirus stereotypes. So it's uh, kind of baffling that they're so understudied given that they make up the bulk of the viral family. So why are they useful? What are we looking for? So what we have here is seroprevalence data. So these are neutralizing antibody responses against adenovirus infections in various people sampled across sub-Saharan Africa. So at five, you can see that pretty much everyone in that population has some degree of pre-existing immunity to ad five, with 48% uh, of them showing very, very strongly neutralizing antibody activity. At 35, there is a species B. You can see that there is much, much lower there are prevalence there, and then the rest of those viruses are all species Ds, and you can see that all of them have very low seroprevalence, especially the AD48 there, the 26 and the 49. So that means that we can start evading the problems with pre-existing neutralization. So if we treat people with a vector based on these things, they're not already going to clear it before it can actually have its therapeutic action. So this is an assay done in VSMCs, vascular smooth muscle cells on the left and endothelial cells on the right. And it shows that these species D viruses are much more capable of infecting these cell types than the AD5 is, um, to varying degrees, that is. So what we can do to start exploring some of these tropisms is we can do something called pseudotyping. So that's the structure of our fiber, um, fiber protein here on, on the top there, and that's a model that I made. It's actually a chimera, but it gives you an idea about what the protein may look like in reality. So what we can do is we can cleave genetically that knob domain sequence out and replace it with that of our species D virus. We can also do something similar in the hexon protein. Uh, the hexon being so abundant is a major part of pre-existing immunity. So this is 
um, this is some really interesting data which came out a while back now, um, where they replaced that fiber knob domain with that of canine adenovirus. So this is just to demonstrate the power of the pseudotyping approach. And they actually showed 15-fold upregulation um, in adenovirus infection when they pseudotyped the canine adenovirus. And they showed this in both neuroblastoma cells, so the U18MGs here, but they also showed it in a bunch of different cell lines, which is shown in that table, achieving up to a 33-fold improvement in um, infectivity than they did with the regular AD5. So just by changing that one protein, we've drastically improved our cancer infectivity. So seroprevalence, there is a bit of confusion in the literature about where that neutralizing antibody response is targeted. And it actually seems to depend slightly on the route of administration. Um, it looks like in a natural infection, most of that neutralizing antibody activity will be against the fiber protein. However, if you do an intramuscular injection, and also partly in a wild type infection, it starts to get very muddled here. There is also a strong neutralizing antibody response against the hexon protein. And that hexon protein is what we've got here on the right. In the gray, we have the structural region, which really forms the capsid and sort of locks together to form that classic virus icosahedron that you get with the denovirus. And that blue region is the externally exposed part. And that contains what we call HVRs, which are hypervariable regions. And these vary wildly between the different adenoviruses. So since that's the exposed region, that's where we get most of our antibody response. So AD5, there will be a lot of people with anti-AD5 HVR antibody responses. Whereas if you expose them to a rarer adenovirus, they won't have seen any hexon proteins which have HVRs like that before. So they won't be able to neutralize the viruses effectively. So by mutating those HVRs, we can start to avoid that, sero um, that seroprevalence. So one example of this came out of the Baruch lab here, um, in the States. And uh, they've actually progressed this virus all the way through um, phase one clinical trial now as a vaccine vector for HIV. Um, what they've done is they've taken AD5 and they've mutated its HVR regions to look like those of adenovirus 48. And, um, I won't go into the clinical trial because it's not really my data to present, um, but they seem to show some really exciting stuff there. And uh, I'll just be talking about a slightly earlier paper from the beginning of the development of this AD5 Enver 48 virus. So on the left here, we have mice which are naive for adenovirus, ex ex adenovirus infection. Apologies. On the right, we have mice which have been pre-exposed to AD5, so they have anti-AD5 immunity. So at the top, what they've done is they've made these viruses so that they express HIV gag protein. And they're trying to assess how much of an immune response they raise against gag after administration with these viruses. So on the left, we have regular AD5. In the middle, we have AD5, which has only one of the HVRs changed for that of AD48. And on the right, we have AD5, which has all of its HVRs changed for that of at 48. So in the naive mouse, all those viruses produce a strong anti-gag immune response, as assessed by an L-spot assay with interferon gamma response. And on the right, we can see that the pre-existing AD5 immunity has completely neutralized the AD5 and the HVR48-1 virus, but the HVR48-1-7 virus, so that's the one with all of the changed HVRs, has successfully provided an anti-gag immunity because it's not been neutralized before it can have its therapeutic action. The bottom two here show two doses of virus, um, again expressing that, but these are measuring cytotoxic T cell responses. So in the naive mice, we have a very strong response at the high infectious dose in all the viruses, and at the low infectious dose, 10 to the 7 VP, AD5 and AD5 HVR48 1 to 7 are having that successful immunogenic activity with gag protein. However, if we look again at our pre-stimulated mice, the ones which have already seen AD5, we can see that at the high enough dose, we managed to get a response against the two control viruses, AD38 and AD48, sorry, 35 and 48. We also managed to get one with our HVR48 virus, but AD5 is completely neutralized even at that high dose Excitingly, though, 
because you don't want to go giving people more virus than you need to, at the lower dose, ad 5 hvr 48 is still immunogenic and producing that cytotoxic T cell response against HIV, um, against HIV gag protein. So it looks like that HPR pseudotyping approach is a very successful method of evading immune seroprevalence. And this is actually something which we are exploring in our lab with other viruses as well, um, both for cancer applications and for vaccine applications as well. So there we are. We've managed to ablate our virus's natural tropism and provide it with a therapeutic one. And now we've found a way to avoid the problems with pre-existing immunity as well. So we've managed to target our virus. We've managed to deliver it to our therapeutic point. So how are we going to actually destroy these cancer cells? So I'm only going to touch on this briefly because it's a whole presentation in and of itself. Um, but there are three broad modalities we can go for here. We can get enhanced viral lysis by using tumor-specific promoters, and we rely on the virus's preferential replication in those cancer cells under that control of that tumor-specific promoter to pop those cancer cells. We can also recruit the immune system by having our viruses encode stimulatory antigens. And then we can actually change the immunological makeup of our tumor as well by expressing antibodies against immuno-oncology targets. So we can actually turn our virus into a triple threat. We can restore healthy phenotypes by targeting those immuno-oncology targets. We can go for selective replication of the therapy at the point of need by using tumor-specific promoters and the virus's innate preference for cancer cells. And we can also express toxic transgenes. Then we can go for enhanced immune recruitment as well, both relying on the virus's own nature as a foreign pathogen, so it's going to present viral antigens on MHC, but also we can bring in transgenic antigens to further recruit the immune system. So to summarize everything that I've been talking about today, we've got this recombinering technology, which is enormously powerful. It makes us able to engineer our virus almost without limit. Um, the, only real, um, the only real consideration is that the virus has to still be able to assemble itself, and it's not able to package DNA much in excess of 105% of its original genome size, which is around 30,000 base pairs. We've Hopefully, I've convinced you that these viruses can be engineered to target tissues of our predetermination. And also, and this I think is a really important one, we require a very detailed knowledge of the basic virology that underpins these viruses in order to go through rational design. There are irrational designs using directed evolution, and that's how that Anatusarev Koload 1 story works, um, but I've not really gone into that one today. However, those still require proper knowledge of the viruses, even to just decide which ones you're going to perform a directed evolution experiment with. I've also discussed how we can really target any mechanism on the cancer cell with these viruses. If it's cancer specific, it can be a virotherapy target because we don't just have to rely on extracellular targets. We can also manipulate the virus's genetic regulation to force proper regulation and upregulation of our virus within the cell itself. And this is a strategy which is employed with a lot of VSV viruses which are in development, and that's vesticular stomitis virus. And I've talked about how these viral vectors can have their therapeutic effect in several different modalities, both as a physically lytic agent replicating within them, or within these cancer cells, as delivery vehicles for therapeutic transgenes, and as a tool for immunotherapy as well. And with that, I just wanted to leave everyone with a list of the citations um, that I've put throughout this um, talk. So please have a look at those papers if anything is of particular interest. And finally, I'd just like to thank our lab's funders and everyone who's been involved with the work that's been going on in our lab that I've been discussing today. And uh, with that, thank you again to LabRoots lab for hosting, and thank you for the invitation by Gibco. Um, I'll be taking questions now, so that's great. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alex, for that informative presentation. We're now ready to start our live Q&A portion of our event. And I just want to remind our audience members how to do so. Just simply type them into the Ask a Question box that is beneath Alex's bio picture, and type your question in and hit send. 
We'll answer as many of our questions, time permitting. And if we do run out of time before we get to your questions, it will be answered via email following the presentation. Okay, let's get started. Alex, we have so many questions coming in, but I'd like to start with this one. Where do you see the field heading in the future? Yeah, so um, that's a pretty common question. Um, I think it sounds very cliche, um, but in some ways we're already there actually because for a very long time the field has been focused only on, only on safety. Um, there was a very high profile uh, death in a clinical trial in the late 90s which uh, set the field back a very long way. Um, but now we've kind of been vindicated. Um, we, went, we all went back to the drawing board. I say we, I wasn't really in the field then. Um, but we all went back to the drawing board. We rebuilt these viruses from the ground up for extreme safety. And that's now been achieved. And we've actually had a clinically approved oncolytic virus for the first time uh, last year. That's um, Tamilogene Leparavec, uh, TVEC. Um, so we're shifting focus now towards efficacy. So there's a lot of trials right now in combinations of oncolytic therapies with existing chemotherapy agents, but what we're working towards in our lab is towards monotherapies with virus. So I think we're just going towards enhanced efficacy, enhanced specificity for our cancers, and whilst of course maintaining that safety aspect. So I think the directed evolution approach has showed a lot of promise, but with the enhanced understanding that we're gaining from these new studies, we can really move towards rationally, de um, rationally designed and extremely efficacious viruses in our next generation therapeutics. And with the understanding of clinical trials and our increasing understanding of cancer genetics and immunology, we can combine these immunological mechanisms with our viruses to fully exploit um, the host immune system and create that triple threat virus that I mentioned at the end there. Alex, I have a question from Nigel. He would like to know where are these viruses sourced from? Um, that's actually kind of a broad question. So, the, um, so yeah, the, what's its name? Yeah, the viruses themselves are isolated in the wild. Uh, there are a handful of people who go around characterizing um, rare and weird viruses. Uh, when they do, they apply for taxonomic identification of them and they get fully um, classified. Um, so we've got 52 fully classified adenoviruses at the moment, but there's 86 candidates as well. Um, and they all get deposited in various um, biobanks around the world. So if we want to work with a specific strain, then we either have to go with the people who have just discovered it and isolated it, or we have to go and just buy it from a bank. Um, if you mean where are the therapeutic viruses sourced from, uh, they all have to go through uh, GM pre-grade production, so that's good manufacturing practice to make sure that they're manufactured in the absence of any toxins and are fully traceable so that they really, they're really drug-grade drug virus. Um, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Alex. Now, this question is two parts. First, did you or anyone else ever try this treatment in pancreatic cancer? Because in pancreatic cancer, the stroll barrier is the major hindrance for the immune system on the attack. Also, since it's the CD8 and the CD4 T cell mediated immune response, do you see preferin or granzyme response along with the IFN gamma response? Right, um, I'll be 100% honest. I have not been running the uh, pancreatic cancer experiments myself. Uh, it's been performed in both our lab by our postdoc um, and also um, in the lab of Gunnar Holden. Um, it's fortuitous timing, actually. Um, we published in combination with Gunnar Holden today on the use of a virus which we made um, using our vector technique in combination with Gunnar's approach using tumor-specific promoters. Um, so please have a look at that paper. It literally just went out this morning. Um, and that will definitely talk more about this. Um, as far as uh, the immune response goes, we're still early days. So we need to better characterize these viruses in the presence of immunological markers, and we need to perform um, 
T cell killing assays to proper assess this. Um, as I say, I'm not the best person to answer that question, so if you would like to know more about that, um, I think my LinkedIn is attached to my profile on LabRoots. Please send me an email and I'll get you a better answer. Okay, our next question. Cancer therapy is administered over long periods, addressing pre-existing immunity through mutation. It's all well and good, but these viruses are still prone to acquiring immunity. How is adapted immunity addressed? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so there are a couple different answers to that. Um, first off, acquired immunity takes time to develop. Um, so if we have a virus which is sufficiently efficacious, um, then it should be able to infect everywhere that we need it to, to have its primary response very quickly. Um, so that will be way faster than we could possibly raise an adaptive response against it. So we'll be able to get to our we'll be able to get to our therapeutic action site long before that develops, and it will have many many days in order to actually have its therapeutic effect and lyse those cells. The other side of it is that, as I said, we've we've moved on from this idea of viruses as a purely lytic agent. So we are talking about engaging host immune response as well. So hopefully what we can do is we can promote um, immune action against the cancerous tissue, which will then create a more lasting anti-cancer effect long after the initial infection has subsided. Uh, the other answer is that we can evade immune response in many other ways as well. So follow-up treatments can be performed with different viruses as well. So if we really perfect this methodology of cloaking from the immune system, then we will end up with a battery of different viruses, which can all act in the same way, but will we'll have different immune, um, immune epitopes. Um, Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a combination effect, basically. Very good. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, do you think there are any dangers involved in administering a virus capable of evading the immune system? Uh, that's another really common question, and it's uh, obviously very valid. Um, it depends on what you mean by evade, because there are many considerations to take into account. So a lot of people will, have, will add immune stimulatory agents. Um, and I know people have in the past expressed concern with combining an immune evading, combining, sorry, an immune evading virus with an immune stimulatory virus because the potential implication of that is runaway autoimmunity. So these things need to be very specifically targeted and carefully regulated. Um, the way that we retain safety is by making sure that our viruses are ultra-specific. So as long as we are not seeing um, prolific off-target effects, then we should isolate that immune response to the tissues where it's actually wanted, i.e. the cancerous and unhealthy ones. The other thing we can do is, uh, is render these viruses replication incompetent. So instead of becoming a replicative virus and acting like a virus, they act purely as a DNA shuttle. So we have our virus, it doesn't even have to have a virus genome if we really packaged it, packaged it right, although that's not been tried just yet, that's my speculation. Um, but we can use these things as a magic bullet, so they just turn up at the cancer site specifically, deliver their genetic payload, and express therapeutic transgenes. And we can include anything we like in that, really, um, within within the size constraints placed on us by the viral genome. So, yes, there are dangers if it's done badly, but all of these will be addressed long before these things ever, seen, um, ever see clinic. Alex, we have uh, some attendees who, um, they'd like to know how do you enhance immune response to the transgene but not the virus? Right, so that can be achieved and uh, it's, so these viruses are very new, um, but by encoding certain antigens, you can raise an immune stimulatory response. So the obvious one will be um, the new immuno-oncology targets. So you could add um, immune checkpoint inhibitors, 
So you could have your virus perhaps expressing antibodies or peptides which will inhibit this effect, or you could actually encode proteins which will allow MHC to express um, immune stimulatory uh, peptides. So uh, there are many uh, cancer neoantigens which have been described, such as 5T4, um, which has been trialed by, yeah, so there's a drug called Trovax, uh, which was recently trialed in Cardiff as well by uh, the Godkin group who work upstairs for me, and they saw some really exciting results with that. So hopefully by combining some of these existing treatments and also by exploiting some new mechanisms, um, we can achieve that also. The virus itself is not always completely exposed. So the only part of the virus which the immune system can see is that external capsid. So I uh, showed that image of um, the hexon protein. And I'll just pull up the slide. Yep, there we are, it should be loading. Um, so that blue section of the hexon protein is exposed to the external environment. So you would expect our immune system to raise a response against that. However, that gray system, uh, gray section, sorry, is hidden from the virus, um, from the immune system when it's actually as an intact virus. However, once it goes into a cell, it's still a foreign protein, but then it gets spliced up and uh, expressed on MHC and everything else. So we're still seeing expression of viral antigens from the cell surface, even though the virus itself is cloaked. Alex, do you? Do you believe that virus therapy is suitable for all cancer types? That's a difficult question to answer because every cancer is unique. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, cancer is not one disease. Cancer is many diseases. So being able to make a broad statement saying that every cancer is going to be treatable with one mechanism um, I think I would probably be lying. That said, with sufficient amount of engineering, we can pick cancers off one by one by using mechanisms which are specific to each of them. So I think so long as there is a mechanism by which we can specifically target that cancer type, then we should be able to raise a virotherapy against it. We just have to be careful in how we do it. Um, I am sure, and well, I know for a fact, some cancers are more resilient than others. So some of them will lend themselves very nicely towards targeting. So for example, I showed uh, on one of the slides the list of various cancers which express uh, alpha V beta 6. I'll just pull that slide up. Uh, yes, so I, I know pancreatic cancer, many of them express it, um, but then others don't, sorry, I'm not being, there we are. Okay, so cervical cancer, the vast majority of them express alpha V beta 6. So perhaps a virus targeted in that method will be very efficacious in, in most cervical cancers. However, if we look at liver cancer there, we see none of them were alpha V beta 6 positive, so that virus would be an inappropriate therapy. Um, yeah, so the answer is honestly, it depends. Okay, thanks, Alex. Um, at what stage of the cancer do you think this treatment will be more efficient? <laughs> right, so there's a few things to consider there. Um, I'm tempted to say, as always, earlier is better because the earlier you detect cancer, the fewer cancerous cells you have to destroy, giving your therapy maximum, uh, maximum efficacy. Um, one of the really nice things about oncolytic virotherapy, though, is that our viruses are replicative agents. So what can happen is, so this is the dream scenario um, where we've completely evaded um, neutralization. Um, we will be able to in, inject a person into, intravenously with our virus. It shoots off, spreads all around the body, but is only capable of infecting our cancerous cells. Once it infects our cancerous cells, it's probably going to go to the main, the primary tumor first of all, because that's the biggest site. So most of the virus is going to get mopped up there, assuming we have a, um, we have sufficient extravascularization in order for our virus to actually infect it. Once it's there, we should see widespread lysis within that within that primary tumor, which will then 
produce more and more progeny variants, which will re-enter the bloodstream and hopefully would be able to then whiz off around the bloodstream and hit any metastases as well. So assuming your cancer is not so advanced that, you, that the therapy is traumatic or anything like this, then I said therapy, assuming the disease is not so advanced that the therapy is in itself traumatic, we should be able to go after metastases. Um, so I would say earlier is better, but not necessarily a barrier. Thank you, Alex. And we have some great questions coming in from our attendees. Um, let's go with this one. Will this treatment be capable to achieve a cure as a monotherapy? Or would it be used as a supplement to other traditional cancer treatments, such as surgery, chemo, radiation? Right, so yeah, um, at the moment, the therapy is largely being considered in combination. Um, that's because currently the field has been so focused on safety for so long that we've actually made our viruses kind of too safe. Um, they aren't necessarily that lytic at the moment in the cancer on their own. However, they do seem to be very good at making our cancer cells vulnerable. So if we hit them with complementary chemotherapy agents, we can achieve that oncolytic effect, um, but not as a monotherapy. That's starting to change now because, as I said, I said earlier, the field has sort of shifted focus, and we're talking about using this as a monotherapy now. Again, this is going to be a cancer-specific effect because the mechanism by which you target it and everything is going to impact the rate of replication of the virus, the specificity of replication, et cetera. So it will be a cancer-dependent um, response. Um, for example, if we target things using cell surface markers, we can probably force a greater number of viruses into our tumor, achieving a more potent lytic effect, but it perhaps and this is very much a perhaps with genetic targeting, we would see cell entry in many other cells, but only replication in our cancer ones, which means that less actual viral copies enter our cancer cells in the first place. So perhaps it might be a, it might be a more protracted effort in order to achieve sufficient um, viral replication for lysis. What could be the mode of drug delivery? Right, so at the moment we generally, I say we, I, I don't run clinical trials, so I'm, I'm a bench monkey. But um, yeah, we tend to use intratumoral um, intra delivery uh, because we don't have to worry about these issues that I described with um, pre-existing immunity as much because these things are never exposed to the bloodstream. Um, prior to their entry into the tumor. Um, but as I mentioned, um, where we're really heading is towards intravenous delivery uh, because that allows us to get a systemic administration of our therapeutic virus and to really reach every aspect of this. And uh, I can't say too much about this at the moment, but uh, watch our lab's publications in the next couple of months. Thank you, Alex. We have time for just a few more questions. Can you tell me a little bit more about the recombinering technology that you mentioned previously? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm actually quite glad for an opportunity to talk about this because it's, uh, it's an incredibly powerful technology. And as far as I'm concerned, everyone should be using it. Um, so traditionally, viruses are engineered by vectorization of the genome in a plasmid and then standard cloning techniques uh, restriction enzyme digests um, are used to alter um, the viral genome. However, restriction digests are only available against certain sites. Um, and whilst there are type 2 methods available, uh, they, don't really, uh, they don't really solve the problem when you have such a massive viral genome. Um, so what this allows is a homology-based cloning technique whereby we can generate a cassette which is specific against any aspect of our, I'm sorry, against any DNA site within our giant plasmid, our bacterial artificial chromosome. So that means that any region of our viral genome is up for modification with no additional steps. So first of all, we create homology arms, so short sequences of DNA uh, which are homologous 
to the area of the virus which we want to modify. And between those arms, we have a cassette which allows us to make sure that we've, um, we've integrated our DNA into the correct place. So we put that cassette in. We use antibiotic selection to make sure that our cassette has gone in. And then we use the same homology arms again, but this time with our edited sequence, whatever that may be, to insert a mutation at the site we wish, uh, sorry, at the site where that cassette now is. So it's first cut and then stick. And then we do that again to cut and stick out our marker and stick in our mutant gene. And we can do that at any site. We can change the, the size of the genes as well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, that was actually developed some years ago now by um, Dr. Richard Stanton and Gavin Wilkinson at Cardiff, and it's since been adopted by labs all over the world, actually. What applications do you think these vectors have beyond cancer? Um, so beyond cancer is an interesting question, and I start to tread on the toes of the gene therapists then. Um, there is an emerging, well, some people probably resent me saying emerging field, but there's a field called uh, can um, cancer gene therapy as well, which works more like treating cancer as a magic bullet, um, as I mentioned earlier, so using these viruses as shuttle vectors rather than as oncolytic agents. Um, the sky's the limit with viral engineering. Um, there are enormous efforts out there at the moment to engineer DNA delivery vehicles um, from the ground up. And the closer they get to an effective DNA delivery vehicle, the more their constructs start to look like viruses with things like decorated liposomes and, um, encase, and, and DNA which is encased in various chemicals and proteins. Um, so if you consider that a virus is really just a mechanism of delivering DNA to where you want it to be, it opens you up to everything because you can then change the very makeup of your cells from the outside. Um, obviously, that is potentially dangerous. You don't want to introduce degenerative mutations. You don't want to cause disease, but you can have corrective mutations as well, which is what people are doing with adeno-associated viruses and many others and lentivectors and everything at the moment. So any application where you want some DNA, an engineered virus is probably your best candidate. Alex, chemotherapy is known, as you know, to make many patients immunosuppressed. Would that affect the efficacy of the viruses in its attempt to hijack the immune system if used in conjunction with chemotherapy? Right, so that's where the uh, triple threat that I was talking about um, comes in. So if you are working with a virus which works purely by immune stimulation, so one of those magic bullet therapies that I was talking about, um, although even that's not entirely, um, even though that's not entirely a uh, monotherapy in itself, um, then you would have some problems there because you would have no method of cancer cell killing without the immunity. However, the virus itself is also a, also a lytic agent. So if there is absolutely no immune response, then our virus is still going to be replicating within those cancerous cells, specifically in the cancerous cells as well, might I add. So it's only going to, it's only going to spread from there unchecked. So you're not going to see, sorry, I'm not being very eloquent here. Right, so what you're going to see is your virus is still continuing to replicate and lyse those cancerous cells even in the absence of an immune response. And there's no immune response to suppress the viral spread, but that's not a problem because our virus has been rendered specific for cancer cell replication. So it will still have the therapeutic action even in the absence of the immune system. But again, this is where we come back to that idea of cancer-specific therapies, because it depends entirely on your cancer's makeup, um, how your virus is going to actually impact it. Alex, we have time for one more question, and I'd like to end with this one. Do you think that there are any dangers involved in administering a virus capable of evading the immune system? Uh, I think I answered a similar question earlier, actually. Um, 
Yes, so if your virus was poorly engineered, yes. But your virus also, let's start with these viruses are not super pathogenic agents. We're not talking about the stuff that you see on the news. We're talking about stuff which maybe gives you a sniffle. So whilst, of course, these things are more dangerous if you're completely immunocompromised and everything else because they can, they can continue replicating unchecked, um, that would be a problem. However, our viruses are engineered in such a way that normal healthy cells are completely able to, to either suppress these viruses, but more to the point, they don't even get infected in the first place. So if a virus is not able to infect healthy cells and your virus is not able to replicate in healthy cells, you've got a double layer of protection against these things, even in the absence of an immune response. So all of these things are addressed preclinically as well, but uh, the safety mechanisms are already in place, and we are vindicated in that these things do work with the now approved therapy TVEC. Thank you again, Alex, for this great live Q&A session. Do you have any final comments that you would like to leave our audience with? Um, no, not really. Um, I'd, I'd just like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today, and it was uh, brilliant to get some really interesting and insightful questions there. Um, please do get in touch with us if you have any further questions. I'm more than happy to, uh, more than happy to answer any other questions by email. And um, if you have any other ideas, please do comment for us. It's been brilliant. Thank you. I would like to once again thank Mr. Alexander T. Baker for his presentation and his important research. I'd also like to thank LabRoots and Thermo Fisher Scientific for making today's educational webcast possible. Now, before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through July 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and we thank you for joining us and hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.